fine fellow all the way from the great state of New York. Uh, he's one of the organizers of one of the many Ruby meetups out there. Um, he, like a lot of us, fell in love with Ruby uh, through the innumerable class. He's going to be talking about that. I've heard a lot of people say, if I couldn't use Ruby, and I had to use language X, as long as I could take a rate with me, I'd be all right. Uh, I feel the same way. So, up next we have Havas Amin, and uh, he's going to be talking about how he fell in love with Ruby.
differential equations or something. That's like, I, you know, I just had to get stuff done. Um, I didn't quite enjoy the programming class and the execution classes. The most fun I had programming was in my research. Um, and that was, you know, where I was actually using it. And I was like, oh, this actually makes sense. I'm doing stuff with it. But I don't really care about what's going on. I just want to get the result that I'm looking for, you know. So I was in that mindset. And uh, never, I never thought that I'd be working. I was like, I can't be sitting in front of a computer every day for the rest of my life. And uh, people, I guess everyone's doing that now. You are not a programmer. But uh, so that's kind of how my attitude towards programming was, even though I've been doing it for, even before college, a little bit. Um, not super seriously. So the last talk actually I gave was a <laughs> research paper on viscoelastic fluids. And you can read this. Half of this doesn't mean anything to me anymore. Uh, that's sad to say that I spent you know two years of my life doing something, and now it's like I'm so immersed in something completely. Well, not completely. Uh, I could say completely different. That I'm starting to forget the stuff I did and earn my degree in. But I'm really happy where I am right now. Um, but yeah, you could tell you that back then, it was just, I'm going to program and get stuff done. And uh, that's it. It was going to be physics all the way from here. But um, one thing that I learned was that, uh, you know, physics formulas don't actually pay bills. <laughs> so I had to find a job after I graduated from college. And I really liked physics. I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it at the grad studies level. And, uh, I was like, all right, I guess I'll get a programming job a little bit reluctant. And again, I count my blessings where I got into a really awesome small startup in Indianapolis where I was doing uh, Ruby work and uh, Rails work with a lot of sysadmin and stuff too. So I really, really, really started enjoying what I did. Like I really, really like look forward to every day of work. And the first thing when I got into Ruby that drove me nuts how ridiculously awesome arrays and hashes are. They're actually fun. I mean, I, I can't tell you how annoyed and frustrated I was iterating over stuff in for loops and C and Java. And I just hated it, like to the bottom of the course. Like, there has to be a more, there has to be a better way to do this. Now, obviously, you know, we're, I'm, I'm, by no means am I'm a, it's the opposite of a polyglot. A monoglot? I guess so. But, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna so, you know, I, I, I indulge in other languages too, but just Ruby for me just got this down really, really well. And I was like, wow, my raising hashes are really, really fun. They have all these cool methods, and uh, they just, I, I love the syntax and the readability of these methods. Like, I can look at a, at a method and I'm not even look at the example and be like, okay, I probably know what this is going to do. So, that's actually very powerful in my opinion. So, what it took me a little while to figure out. I was like, hey, all that stuff is powered by this enumerable module. So it raised hashes, and, and then one eight strings, I guess, were enumerable. Now, and one another quasi enumerable. They're not technically mixed in. Um, files do it, sets and ranges also use enumerable. So, what is a neural module? It's a, it's a mix in, it's a module. Uh, like uh, like uh, all modules in Ruby, it's mixed in to get some add functionality to whatever class you're mixing it in. Uh, essentially, it gives you a bunch of methods that allow you to work with collections. Um, the most uh, basic concept of collection, of course, is an array, and that's kind of the basis of a lot of stuff. So a lot of the methods, in, in turn, would return arrays, um, unless you're dealing with hashes or sets of ranges, and then they would return those respectively. But yeah, most notably, it powers the array and hash um, classes, and that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about mostly today. So how do you mix in enumerable in your classes? You have to have the each method. So as soon as you define the each method, you essentially have an enumerable object. <coughs> um, your methods collect, select, and all those. They essentially take the yielded output from each, and uh, they perform their respective uh, behavior. So here's a quick little example. We have a class called Planet Express. Um, yeah. No, here I'm a big Futurama fan, even though I'm totally out of date on this evening. But I will catch up with that. Uh, so yeah, we uh, just uh, include a new rule there, define an each method, and very simple. It's just yielding four strings, Bender, Friar, Leela, and Zoiper. Um, nothing fancy here. And then that collect is able to work because it is aware that there is an each method defined uh, available to this class. 
that will allow me to that will allow me to do what I want to do. So most of the methods in the neural module are working that way too. Why is it so sexy, right? I mean, okay, so I'm sure you can mix it in, right? And to me, it's it's this. These are all. I think these are all the methods. I might have missed a few that are available in the neural module. And Sounds like crazy nonsense, but I actually really, really like them because I, I look at all of those and right off the bat, you know, if you if you're if you're kind of familiar with programming and come from another language, you're like, oh you can probably figure out 70 or 80 percent of them or have an idea what they do just by their names. And it's like, oh that's awesome. Uh, there was a code I was trying to find with this talk and I couldn't find it, and I think it was from someone from someone respectable from the job community who said uh, it's kind of ridiculous how many methods are available in our list, which is an array class. Essentially, it was a critique. It's like, oh, there shouldn't be so many aliases. There shouldn't be so many methods available in a list class. But I actually really, really like that because it allows us to think of different paradigms, even if it's the same method. right? We can alias it, and like we have inject, but the reduce method in 1.9 is actually alias to inject. Uh, inject. And you have concepts like, oh, map reduce isn't just this notion of, you know, Hadoop and living in Mongol world. It's like, this is basic stuff that we can do and Ruby empowers us to implement data structures and concepts that are familiar in other languages, even if they're not available in core Ruby, it allows us to do that. And the enumerable module is an excellent example. So again, for me, it was programming happiness. Everyone's seen this code here if you've been to enough Ruby conferences. I think at least every Ruby conference, it's standard. At least one person must show this code and I'm glad that I'm the one doing it here. Uh, programmers often feel joy when they can concentrate on the creative side of programming, so Ruby is de designed to make programmers happy. Uh, the last part, Ruby is designed to make programmers happy. And that's exactly what the enumerable module does for me. It's exactly what dealing with arrays and hashes and sets and file does for me. I hated dealing with files in C. I'm sure most of you would agree. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's great. So now we're going to just quickly gloss over a few um, enumerable methods. Some of these will be re re really basic, uh, and most of you are probably familiar with them. There will be little tidbits here and there throughout the, uh, throughout the talk. I think there are like uh, three or four Dr. Zoyberg tips, so, you know, the doctor is in. So let's look at some methods. Uh, so this, this is each basically allows us to iterate, right? Right off the bat, I feel... The, how do I say this, I guess, no, that's not the right word. The, the Englishness of each makes perfect sense to me. I know exactly what's going to happen. I can give it a block, and there are two do's there, which is a typo. Ignore that for now. <laughs> um, but yeah, it essentially, uh, it, it, it yields items that are supplied, supplied in the block, and you can, you can basically implement it in a, in a class when you're including it and you get a lot of other stuff for free, such as find. Just a nice little, nice little uh, method, basically finds one record uh, given the condition of the block. <coughs> What's kind of cool is like, I, it's, the simplicity of it's very elegant. But as, as we start going through some of the stuff, try to kind of think of like the other stuff that we deal with on a daily, da daily basis, like such as active record, which uh, if most of us are use Rails, uh, think about how it's doing um, its own stuff on top of the near rule, right? So, you think about associations in active record. So they, you get an array back, right? So you have has many posts, a blog has many posts, but you can't just you can't just um, you can't just add stuff, right? You can't use the add operation uh, on that. It, it actually gives you not a lot of uh, operation error, right? Because they've actually you, you can't append to it. Active record has its own very specific way of dealing with how an array should behave, right? It has its own concept, its own criteria for what it is. Which is really cool because it allows you to make your own data structures that are based on other data structures. Um, a really, really great example of that, if you guys ever get a chance, is look at the Mongo Ruby driver. It's probably one of the best libraries in Ruby that I've ever come across. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of it, but it's a good, it's a good exercise in going through, um, taking just regular data structures and looking at um, arrays and hashes and, and all things that are known to us and that we're very comfortable with as Rubyists, and see how you can implement it to deal with a story in a nice way. Group by, this is kind of an interesting one. I've actually never really used this, 
but I, I, I can totally see how awesome it is. Um, so you have, basically, it takes a block and it returns a hash, and the key of that hash is actually the, um, the return value of the block. So let's see, so right now we're taking all the names, Fry, Bender, Leela, and Zoidberg, and we're, the block of what it's doing is just looking for all the names that are longer than that. That's actually wrong, that should be count. So that would actually have type of should be named count, right? So then the count would be four. So fry is four letters long. So that's why that's the key's four. So uh, that's a little bit tough. But are you guys following me here, though? We're on the same page? It's been a long flight. All right. Been <laughs> New York is far. But uh, yeah, this is cool. I mean, uh, it's uh, think about how you could use this for, as a little, you know, attack cloud mechanism, right? Just doing attack cloud if you have all these strings or all these values, I just want a quick tag cloud in. They're already indexed by uh, the key is already, you know, your um, the value of the cloud, which is which is kind of interesting, right? So you can just be like, hey, I want ten. I want something that appears ten times or more than more than ten times, and then you can iterate over the keys and just get that without having to iterate over the whole patch, which is kind of cool. Grep is awesome. Um, we're all, uh, I think somewhat familiar with the Unix Nix environment. You know, that's that's kind of how I actually got my <coughs> like, hey, you know, program, but you're actually, you know, you've done plenty of system and stuff, so we can kind of do that too. So I'm like, hey, cool, this is cool. And I love how Ruby kind of stays true to some of those concepts and uses them. It uses the same vernacular. So it's like it, so it's not only is it easier for someone from another program language who's familiar with that environment to come around, but also if they're not familiar with it, if they go, like I've seen this in meetups, where uh, some guys are starting to learn Ruby, they're not necessarily from a Unix background, and they're like, hey, oh, I, on a command line, I can actually do grep, that's how Ruby does grep, and that's amazing, that not only is Ruby promoting its, the ease, easiness of its, of, to learn it, but also it's promoting, like, hey, go check out this other stuff where we can borrow uh, ideas. So essentially it's just this pattern matching, right? One kind of important thing to know is that it uses the triple equals operator for pattern matching, which brings us to our next Dr. Soyberg tip, which um, is cool. So you can actually not only grep for a pattern, like a regex pattern, but you can actually grep for objects. So if you have a list, you can say like, hey, I, I want to grep for strings or um, an instance of something, which is, it's powerful. I've used it a few times in some of the stuff I've done. And it's definitely one of the things that I think gets glossed over. And mapping collection. I actually had the hardest time with mapping collection. I didn't. I was a little afraid of them when I first got into Ruby. I kept on using each, even though I kind of knew that this they're probably what I want to use. Uh, but I think the problem was I, I don't like the name mapping collection. I think we should think of it more as a transform. So that's kind of how I think of it. It's like, hey, here's a, here's a collection, and I'm doing some transform on transform on that collection. And the result is an array that's executed that transform. That makes more sense to me in my mind, but um, others might disagree. So map is uh, obviously very powerful. We're going to look at some cool things we can do with map later on. Uh, it's definitely uh, different than each. Each returns essentially its caller. A map returns the transformation that was done on the, on the collection. Um, so now we're going to talk about the enumerator a little bit. Essentially. If you take a look at, let's see, so we've talked about how we can create, you know, basically give enumerable methods, make them available to a class by mixing in that class, but there are also other ways to get those methods without actually doing the whole mix-in process, without actually including the module. And there are three of them that I come across. Uh, there might be some others, actually, too, from some monkey patching and method grants, but these are just Kind of fairly straightforward in my opinion and common practices. Excuse me. You can uh, create an enumerator explicitly with a code block, you can attach an enumerator to another object, or you can create an enumerator implicitly without a block. So this is the first uh, first method. So basically what we're doing here is we're calling the enumerator class, which again includes that enumerable, and we just, uh, the, the when you pass the block, why there is actually the yielder. It's actually an instance of enumerated yielder. So you never want to actually yield, and you never call it yield when you're using the 
this method, you always append to the yielder. Uh, so just a quick little tidbit there. The other way is you actually attach the image to another object. This is actually a fairly popular, um, fairly popular scheme. I've seen it in a bunch of libraries. Basically, it knows the enumerator knows how to implement each based on the method that you're passing it. So here we're saying like, hey, I want you to implement each using the select method, right? And because select is essentially doing uh, is essentially doing what I want each to do. So you get an enumerator out of that too. I'm binding the enumerator to the select method for this names array in uh, this scenario right here. And we'll actually see uh, a nice application of that soon. And the last one is like we can create enumerator implicitly with uh, without blocks uh, by just calling iterators without. Uh, and this is really really cool stuff. I actually did not know this until I uh, started preparing for this talk. So here basically I have uh, math, and if I don't pass math a, a block, I get the enumerator. So that's kind of cool, but why do we care? So here are some uses, and there are a bunch more, but I'm just going to label a couple of them. Um, it's, perhaps you want to add enumerability to an existing object. So an object that maybe you don't want to monkey patch and you know, include enumerable in. You just want to, for, for your main, for instance, you just want to add the ability to like, hey, you want select, map, collect, and all that stuff. So enum4, which is the second way that we talked about, is actually pretty awesome. Because say that you have basically a method in that object, in that class, that acts like each, but isn't each. But you can give it all the other enumerable methods by telling it, it's like, hey, since this is really what I want each to be like, consider that to be, uh, consider that for my enum. Uh, for my enumerator. So I'm going to say survey parts is actually is actually going to map to what I want each to behave like. Obviously this isn't necessarily how you want to necessarily write something. If you're, you probably just want to regularly include the enumerable uh, class, but it comes in handy if it's say a library that you don't want to necessarily monkey patch or it's a certain instance of it and uh, it's, out of, it's, it's out of your scope for your domain. Fine-grained iteration is kind of cool. I kind of saw some people talking about this uh, in my research. It's, it's basically an enumerator is an object, right? So it has a notion of state. So it's not just an iterator. Iterators have no sense of state. Um, so you can, uh, you have to, essentially you can say something like, hey, get me to the next thing, get me to the next thing, we'll rewind, which would be kind of cool. And I have, this is a toy uh, idea, but it would just be interesting to see how you can implement like a state machine. Uh, in, such a, in such a way, which would be an, definitely an interesting exercise. So the coolest thing is like, you can actually change some types of enumerators, which for the most part doesn't make sense. We'll talk about that right now. So normally when you chain, uh, if you chain map and then you chain select with it without any blocks, you might as well just do names.select. You're just, you're just, essentially you're passing on, um, so map is basically just passing on Values of the array to select. It's just piping it through. There's, it doesn't know what function to apply to. It doesn't know what block to apply to. So there's nothing going on there. So most enumerators, that's always happens. So chaining enumerators for the most part doesn't really make any sense. Doesn't do anything, except a couple of ways. In, in a couple of places, it, it actually comes in handy. This is another sort of great tip: lazy slicing. So you can the each slice method, which is awesome. I use it a lot, especially when I'm doing some view helper stuff. Uh, you know, if you're doing carousel views and stuff with, like, say, 15 or 20 you know, books and you have jQuery plugins and stuff doing that. But uh, anyway, so lazy slicing, you can tell each slice, uh, you can pipe that to map. And basically, uh, what, what this gives you is when you normally run each slice, say I have 15 um, items, it would create 15, or if I have 20 items and I'm slicing it by five, it's going to create. Um, it's going to create slices, five, wait, hold on. So it slices with five items in it each, right? And so load that into memory. And that's going to be memory. However, if you, if you um, chain it with map, it gets lazily evaluated. So map will only use it when it needs it, which is definitely like a nifty little tool. Not sure if you're, if, if it'd be huge optimization boost that is from point, but definitely, if, if you can little things here and there, then why not, right? You have to create the power of uh, 
and that with index. So we have each with index, which we all love. I love it. The first time I came up, I was like, oh, awesome. I don't have to keep track of the index. And like another local variable that I'm going to throw away later on. This is great. So map with index, and there, there have been several Ruby threads on it. People are like, hey, we want this in core Ruby. It should be here. You know, it's just like each with index. And it hasn't been implemented yet. I don't know if it ever will. But we can actually implement it ourselves, which is pretty awesome. I, I found out about this, I think, a year into Ruby, and I use it all the time. You can chain with index, which is an immutable method with map, and you basically you have the same power. And that's awesome because it's something that's generic. The with index is a generic method that's not tied down, so you can you can chain it with other stuff too. Um, so that, I think that's the last uh, tidbit or Dr. Zoidberg tip. <coughs> I'm going to talk very briefly about the set class and explore the set class in the 1.9, which uses the enumerable uh, module. And just as a, it's, it's a nice exercise to both with stuff off in Ruby and see what's going on. And at least any of it that you can understand. A lot of it might be, you know, obfuscated C code. But if there's stuff written in Ruby, especially stuff in standard language, you should totally go check it out. So set class is a standard class in Ruby. You're, you have to explicitly require it um, and store is basically unique. Values and it does use the enumerable module in this. So you can see here, it, uh, this is the code straight out from uh, from Ruby code from the standard lib. So it includes the enumerable module, it defines each, and it's very very clear what's going on here. It calls a it calls a block for each member of the set. So it's, and it's also passing the member as a parameter. And uh, if there's no block, then it just returns that enum for which is your enumerator, as we visited earlier. Okay, underneath. The layer set is actually using hashes, which is kind of cool. Um, I found this out personally a lot later than I think I should have. Um, hashes in Ruby, uh, the keys are always unique, which is a kind of a nippy little tool to use. Uh, we, we were doing this at uh, uh, Ruby games where we just hack on little problems, and one of them was uh, parsing a log file and you know unique entries in a log file. Just as an exercise, and we were trying to compete. We had the best algorithm. We had benchmarks, and we were competing. And uh, I learned this uh, through. That exercise with some of my friends, like, hey, um, once you the keys on a hash is always unique, so you can you can just uh, change the key and it'll always guarantee that you're never updated. You're, you're never gonna have non-unique key. So what it's, what the hash is doing is basically storing the values as keys. What set is doing is storing values as keys in a hash, <coughs> ensuring their uniqueness. And here's uh, just a quick example of how it's set has its own notion of what include should be, right? Just how we were talking about active records, many relationships, but even though the array has its own notion of what adding stuff to an array should be. And uh, it's essentially checking, uh, run, it's essentially executing the include method on hash, right? So it's actually using in rules to the other level. It's using you know, the hash class of the name. Uh, it defines its own. That's how it's defining its own uh, implementation. But there are also other methods in the set class that I encourage you guys to go check out and look at how they're doing things, uh, their own way to you know, preserve what the notion of a set is and uh, using basically just overriding um, innumerable methods to match their own use case. So are you in love with Ruby yet? If you weren't, very disappointed. <laughs> You don't have to be monogamous, right? You can't go to the one <laughs> so, It's okay. I love JavaScript. There's a lot of good stuff out there. Not read this book. This was an inspiration for a lot of this talk. David Wag is is really, really good. At this is one of those books you want on your bookshelf. Really, it's it's good to grab up, uh, grab and look at. You know, the year down the road. This was written in 2009, and it's uh, Ruby 1.9 edition, but it's still relevant right now. And actually. The book before this that he wrote, Ruby for Rails, is actually another really, really great read because it shows about the techniques in Ruby, like all the, all the, uh, the di dynamics and the monkey patching, the metaprogramming, and the innumerable stuff, and how Rails uses it uh, to achieve what it does. And this was like, kind of a rewrite of that to a core, and it has an excellent section on innumerable. Um, so yeah, that's me on GitHub, Twitter, and Tumblr. And I just have this one last thing to say that you know, I really, really, whenever I talk to someone, I'm like, if, you, if there's something 
you don't understand, you know, come to me and I'll help you figure it out. I kind of want you guys to pass that along, you know. There's, there's got to be something in Ruby that you really you like. Revisit again, because I bet you you're going to fall in love with it all over again. Look, there's how regexes are dealt with, ranges, sets, metaprogramming, you know, all the things in Ruby that, especially for those of you that have been doing it for a while, you kind of forget, you know, they're, check out Node.js, it's really cool, and it is. JavaScript is awesome, but, you know, it's always good to go back and see why you like language and why you fell in love with it, and then realize more reasons to fall in love with it all over again. And the best part about it is you, it'll always help you transfer and appreciate the next thing you're learning or the previous thing that you're learning. So with that, I would just say thank you and go make some love. Not sure. Um, uh, so the, the question was uh, the example of using um, essentially the iterator example, the implied grain iteration, where I was using next. Um, I've actually used it as a toy app for like the scenes thing that you saw, but basically kind of like a state machine for scenes in a film. I have I'm not sure what any performance but uh, uh, performance implications it has, but it's definitely I'm not sure if I would actually use it for an actual state machine. It's just kind of a idea that I. Yeah.